Welcome back to Real Repairs for Real Anxious Customers. You may have discovered that most of the requests for plastic repairs are in the cargo areas of SUVs. If you found that true in your case, you'll be interested in jumping in the back with me today and repairing some polypropylene. So, ready to go? Let's do it. Polypropylene is a great choice for the cargo areas on these SUVs. It has a characteristic waxy feel to it, which is ideal for repelling any kind of liquids and any staining at all. It also resists scratches quite well. So when you do see scratches on it, you know that it was from something quite substantial. And with uh, items being thrown in or thrown about as you travel, they can scratch quite deeply sometimes, as you see here. Also, the glove box here is polypropylene and has a considerable deep scratch. So, as usual, we'll begin by prepping all of the panels. I'm using a water-based degreaser here and a gray scuff pad. Let's get all the soils and contaminants off of there. I have some solvent here trying to get off that bit of what appears to be some sort of paint. And while we're at it, we're going to prep all of our panels with the solvent. All right, feel free to pause the video if you'd like to join me for a coffee break. Most plastic panels will have a designation stamped into the back of them. In this case, we see polypropylene plus EP. That tells us that it contains 20% talc for stability and burn resistance. This panel has high crystalline polypropylene for increased stiffness, and that allows for a thinner gauge panel, something to consider when you're heating it. EPDM, a type of synthetic rubber added to give it exceptional water and heat resistance. Is this too much information? Yes, it certainly is. But the takeaway is that from one manufacturer to the next, the polypropylene panels may exhibit very unique characteristics. They're not all exactly the same. But since polypropylene is a thermoplastic, that gives us our clue to our repair process. A thermoplastic is one that can be melted, it can be reshaped, reformed, and then it solidifies when cooled. And for our type of surface damage, we're going to be using the smoothing tip as opposed to the speed tip, which is used for feeding new material in. This may be a 30-year-old welder, but the rheostat still works. Don't worry, I replaced the heating element about 15 years ago, so we're good. Select a temperature setting that lets you melt just the surface of the polypropylene while you're gliding across the top. Any hotter than that, and you will dig into the polypropylene and cause more damages. This means that for any given repair, you'll have to experiment a little bit with this heat setting. You may discover that you have limited results when smoothing the plastic with just the iron. That's because you're melting the plastic with the iron itself, but the plastic adjacent to it is cold. So in my kind of unique approach here, I am warming all of the plastic around the area of the repair so that when you blend, it blends in just as smooth as butter. This is also helpful because now you can see that we don't need such a high heat setting on the welder itself. We're using it in conjunction with the heat gun. And I have the heat gun at its highest setting here, so I am able to melt uh, the surface rather quickly. 
and just have to bear in mind that the I, I can go close if I need extra heat or just general heating I can hold the heat gun at a greater distance. I think this is the solution that you are looking for using the heat gun in concert with the plastic welder. Now if you have a large area to do you may find that you've got uh, an area that looks rather smooth uh, compared to the grained uh, polypropylene. And what you saw me use a bit ago was a graining pad. Now we want to be very careful in use of a graining pad. As you can imagine, when you heat the plastic panel, the heat itself may warp the panel. Uh, and as certainly you could imagine that if you pushed against that heated panel, you can warp it so easily. So what you see me using here is a wet or dry sponge pad. So the 3 8 inch foam pad absorbs the downward pressure and it keeps me from pushing the plastic. It only serves to hold the graining pad to the plastic, making a minimal amount of grain, just breaking up the surface so it's not so flat and shiny. And I'm only concerned about using the graining pad on the larger areas. When you're using a heat gun next to carpeting, it's a good idea to have something down to deflect the heat away from the carpeting. In this case, I'm able to use a piece of cardboard butted up to the plastic. Or you could use the high temperature green masking tape, which you'll see me use in a little bit. And uh, that's the good quality tape, which I carry anyway. So when the polypropylene gets scratched, it imparts hundreds of tiny cracks, which make it look white in appearance. But as we heat it up and melt it together, we restore the original color. And restoring the original color goes a long way towards completing our repairs. I'm in the way of the repairs further up, so we'll just show you working here towards the rear. There's no doubt about it, uh, fixing a myriad of scratches takes some time. But uh, that's the other advantage of using the heat gun ahead of your repairs, is you've warmed up all that plastic ahead of time and that speeds up the job so much. I'm probably seeing some damages that the camera doesn't see and then on the other hand you'll probably see some on camera that I'm not seeing depending on our angle, our viewpoint angle. Here you can see the wisdom of a two inch green tape used to deflect the heat from the carpet.
For the deeper scratches, you may see me pulling plastic into the scratch, uh, simply because with polypropylene, very seldom is there actually plastic missing. If you've made a gouge in the plastic, then the plastic is still there, but it's in a high spot. You've just plowed a furrow. And so you can pull from the high spots and replace the plastic back to its original location. This vehicle is a sold unit, and so we're going to speed up the video by six times just so that we can get it delivered quicker.
So we've made some plastic paint by adding our pigments to our plastic primer. And as you know, the plastic primer by itself is very shiny. Therefore, we've added a good bit of flattener to it, which is very standard procedure, especially with polypropylene. Now in my first application, I am using a very low pressure and so this is really a texture step. Because the droplets are large on the texture step, it usually has the appearance of being a bit shiny and a bit darker in color. Bear in mind though, that we're going to come across the top of this with a finely atomized coat. And that atomized coat will allow the flattener to kick in and do its job even better. Of course, the coating, as you see here, is a bit light and a bit shiny while it's wet. Notice I'm not really masking anything off. If you have the correct color, it will blend in the panel. There's no need to re-dye every part of the panel. Just blend in the repair areas and you're done. So that's the advantage of getting a good color match. It saves a lot of time and effort. This is our final coating. This is a light mist coating with the hair dryer following, drying it down right away. So we've just atomized uh, a little better by upping the pressure. Now we're back to adjusting the pressure for the texture step again. When the damage is this extensive in a wide flat panel, I'm sure you can see the advisability of texturing the entire panel to get everything to blend in. And the other problem that uh, folks uh, seem to have is uh, having shiny areas of the repairs. And so we might uh, just highlight again the need for extra flattener in your paint. Uh, that's going to work wonders uh, for the coating. If you still see some shiny areas, go back and uh, add some flattener back into your paint and strain it again. And while that's drying, we're going to texture the glove box and our other right hand panel. The next clip is a short little clip of the final color coat. Unfortunately, the camera gives me no warning that the card is full. And so what we're doing here, just uh, cleaning up a little bit of overspray. As you know, with the water-based paints, if you get it right away, it's not a big deal it's easier to clean it up than it is to mask off everything. And for good measure, I'm cleaning off some grease spots from that upper panel. So we've got it ready for delivery, and here's just a walkthrough of the finished product. 
There were a couple of spots that could use some extra attention, but since the phone kept ringing and they were so anxious uh, for it, that limited uh, the time I could spend in it. I like it. I'm really happy. The customer was absolutely ecstatic. They didn't dream that the thing could look brand new again. And I hope you've enjoyed this simple but effective approach to repairing polypropylene. And before signing off, I'd like to just share a little bit about my schedule that some have inquired about. I'm no longer uh, trying to work a full schedule. I would prefer to work smarter and not harder, if possible. And music is very much a part of my business. And so on days when I have a music engagement, I try not to work in the field at all. I find that I don't have the mental acumen to switch gears between field restoration work and music work. So it's better that I focus on music on those days and get in the zone, if you will. And then, as in a recent gig out of town, I could travel without rushing. And I took my hotel room with me and camped out overnight uh, before returning home. So when I took this picture, it was 5 o'clock in the morning. The temperature outside was 38 degrees. The temperature inside, a cozy 52. And as you can see, I've got a cup of coffee coming down. Nice way to start the day. Thank you for watching. And thank you for caring about quality workmanship. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and hit the bell to be notified of future video uploads.